foods and malocclusion. It has often been said that you are what you eat. Malocclusion seems to have progressed over the last 10,000 years. It was almost unheard of before the agricultural revolution uh, when people started farming and the um, hunter-gatherer way of life gently came to a close. And there seems to be a close relationship between what we were eating and malocclusion, teeth becoming crooked. Now, there are many ideas on the relationship of nutrition and facial development and malocclusion. Of course, there's the work of Weston Price that suggests that it's a lack of the fat-soluble vitamins, in particular vitamins A, D and K, and that if you don't have enough of these vitamins prior to a baby being conceived, then you have what's called a prenatal injury that can lead to problems with craniofacial development that then leads to malocclusion in many situations. It, this is an interesting idea. It's unfortunately exceptionally difficult to test such an idea. This concept of being a prenatal injury makes it very difficult to test this theory. And I've had many discussions with um, advocates of Price's work specifically on this, and there is a lack of evidence in this area. However, one thing that is very obvious is the difference of where between Paleolithic, medieval and modern humans that seems to relate very closely to the change in malocclusion. We forget how much these individuals wore their teeth down. The Paleolithic man would wear his teeth down so that when he reached 45, and interestingly, Paleolithic people were more likely to reach 45 than medieval people were. We have this um, dip as we left the Garden of Eden in um, life expectancy and probably in quality of life as well. Um, so if Paleolithic man reached the age of 45, it was not uncommon for them to have worn their tooth number six, the first permanent molar, down to the gum. That was fairly consistently normal. It's so consistently normal that that's the method of aging skulls in that period. And this didn't change that much till the medieval period although malocclusion increased significantly over that period. And from the medieval period to the present period, we've seen a complete change in the level of wear of teeth. It's rare now for you to wear through just the tips of the cusps of the teeth by the time you die. And we're living now to 70, 80 years old and it's twice the age levels that our ancestors were living to, if not 90 years old. And even at these ages, we won't have worn through the cusps of the teeth, let alone wearing through the enamel in the crevices, let alone getting halfway down through the enamel of the tooth substance, let alone getting right the way down to the base of the tooth. So we're talking a huge change in the level of effort, the level of wear. And part of this, of course, is attributed to the fact that a Paleolithic man, and to some degree even medieval man, was using their teeth not only for eating. There was a lot of what we call non-nutritive wear. So wear that was gained not through nutrition, that was gained through using your teeth as a tool. In the Paleolithic era, if you wanted a nice leather top, you had some chewing on your, on your hands. You had to chew the leather 
until it was soft and malleable. You couldn't go down to a tannery. There weren't any tanneries. There's a phrase um, about goods made by hands of others. Roughly till the 1880s, most of the goods you had, you made yourself or were made by people you knew. Back in the Paleolithic era, nearly everything you had, you made yourself. And this period of time is really marked by a change from a very tough, very hard, fibrous, difficult to eat food um, um, such substances that also had very low calories. Now I'm not talking about the nutritional value because I think they probably grazed and they had a very high nutritional value, but calorifically it, it left a lot to be desired. Of course it tended to be very carb free and anyone who's gone on a carb free diet would be very aware of how effective that is, how carbs are easy to gain calories and of course you didn't have much wheat. That wasn't found um, um, until the beginning of farming, the advent of the agricultural revolution approximately 10 to 8,000 years ago in Turkey. Of course you didn't have rice, you didn't have potatoes um, that were relatively recent into the European diet. Uh, you didn't have sugar which was as recent into the European diet. And you didn't, at least in the Paleolithic era, have really um, calories from milk and again a relatively easy carbohydrate. Um, and this has moved through, through the medieval period where we were doing subsistence farming plus. They were subsistence farming but also uh, there was a, a reasonable amount of cash crop. You people with farms would sell um, a percentage of what they grew. Through to the modern environment where, well, we've moved from 90% of the population working on farms in the medieval period to 2% of the population working on farms now. So really it's farming as cash crops. That's what farming is about. It's making a profit. It's um, getting a buck for your acre or your hectare. And now we know how to make carbs. We know how to make these, the wheats, the, um, to make pasta. To, um, to make the rice and um, sugar, and what's not, what is sugar not in, particularly in processed foods today. The ease of gaining calories is, it was too easy. I mean, you look at the obesity rates, the obesity epidemic that's occurring now. And we've gone from hard to eat, low calorie diet, to a phenomenally um, calorie rich, phenomenally soft diet. I mean just the terminology we use, we say steaks are good if they're tender. We don't say that was a tough steak, it was excellent. Or a fibrous steak, it was excellent. We talk about a, a soft, you know, tender steak, that's a particularly good steak. Um, and it's probably not just um, the, the absolute hardness of the food. Um, there's um, fibrous uh, um, elements to diets and of course there's also sort of um, the size. Um, recently um, I've been experimenting with different foods and if you have very small little um, grainy um, substances or particles, particular small particular food, it takes a lot of grinding with your teeth, a lot of heavy mastication um, of course it was represented by the wear on these teeth these individuals had. But I estimate that modern humans are wearing their teeth or using their masticatory system about two maybe three percent of what our Paleolithic ancestors were doing. Now, we'll be aware that our skeletal, our general skeletal structure has changed from 
the level of where we were doing, the level of, sorry, effort we were making with our physical skeletal structure to about 30% of what we were doing previously, as a rough estimation. And that has come with a moving of the shoulders, a whole change in the um, stance of people where there's that reduction of muscle tone has occurred. Well, if that's happened with a 60% reduction down to 30%, the 97 to 98% reduction in effort, it's, it's huge. You know, it's, 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 you know, it dwarfs the reduction in skeletal um, usage, um, of the general body usage. And I think it's having a profound effect on the facial system. Take some time to look around individuals that have good square jaws and strong musculature. They are noticeably different from individuals who have weak muscles and don't use their masticatory system as much. And that is affecting the growth pattern of faces. People with strong muscles, their faces are wider, in fact, I would go more than that, it's, it's well seen, I mean, Kiliadis did some interesting research and he's shown that the interpupillary distance is wider on people with strong muscle tone. It's, you know, the whole face is wider just from chewing hard things. And as I said, probably even chewing fibrous things, you know, a, a tough fibrous diet is going to be lower in calories from the amount of fiber that's in it. And it's going to require more effort to using your tongue, using your cheeks, but also using your masticatory system, using your um, chewing, you're chewing more. Um, and I think this has had a profound effect on the craniofacial growth and it's lowered, lengthened the whole craniofacial structure. And of course, the longer, thinner craniofacial structure has less cross-sectional area. And this is a space for the teeth. Of course, if you have less space for the teeth, they're more likely to be crowded. And interestingly, this epidemic in crooked teeth is evident over exactly this time period, um, accelerating over the last few hundred years, accelerating over the last 50, 30 years. You know, most people's grandparents can remember a time when few people had orthodontics or even needed orthodontics. Whereas a time now where in, in many schools 50% of the population are having orthodontics. And it's not just because it's available and they have the money to have it. Many of them really need it. And we need to wonder what's happened and why that's happened particularly when we see the levels of relapse that we have today. All, almost universal relapse. If you don't wear your retainers after orthodontic therapy, almost always the result will relapse. Now, why? Why are the teeth crooked in the first place? The evidence doesn't suggest it's the genes. The evidence stacks up in favour of factors such as a change in masticatory effort, the masticatory usage. Now, what can we do about that now? Well, we all live in a modern environment. What are we going to do in a modern environment? Um, I think an attempt to choose tougher foods. Um, in my purely anecdotal evidence of looking around, I'm finding some pretty tough breakfast cereals, um, dried fruit, particularly dried mangoes, um, a lot of crunchy salads, but this has to be a large chunk of your food stuff. Um, I've had some mothers tell me, oh, little Johnny is eating raw carrots. And I go, oh, wonderful. I said, how many raw carrots does he eat a week? Oh, about three or four. I don't think that's going to be enough 
to make a significant difference. We need to, if we're only eating or only make exerting a masticatory effort of two to three percent, what our ancestors did, you need to do more than a few carrots. It's really got to be a large chunk of your diet has got to be tougher. Now it's not easy. People are lazy. People don't like changing. But at the end of the day, and what seems to be a recurring theme in life, how you are is down to you. And this is no exception.